Amen. Nothing brings me more happiness than to see our youth and our little ones praising God Amen. and being raised to be faithful to God. I just, that was the most precious thing. Amen. Oh, that made, mm, that made me so happy. Um, and that's honestly, that's the future of our church. That's the future. Um, I know I don't look that old, but I'm only getting older. Um, and our little ones and our youth and our young adults, they're the ones that are going to take those reins. Um, and my biggest fear is that they're being left behind and that we're losing a generation. But it's not too late. And with God, it's never too late. Amen. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for that special music, for that children's story. It, it just brought joy to my heart. It was so beautiful. Um, please be with me this morning. Give me the words. Allow me to speak the words you want me to speak and, and be with us as a family here gathered today this morning. We ask you this humbly in your son's name. Amen. So uh, a little bit about myself. My name is Josue Sanchez. The kids at camp call me Pastor Josh. You can call me Josh as well. That's fine. Um, it's Joshua in English anyway, so it's still my name. Um, I went to Southern Adventist University. That's where I graduated in my undergrad with theology. And then I was with Florida Conference for a little bit. And then I went to the seminary at Andrews. Um, and the weather today, although it seemed very cold, believe me, this is a warm summer breeze at Andrews University. <laughs> and uh, so I was, I was expecting it to be a little bit warmer, but it's okay because it's warm enough in this church. Amen. And uh, so I'm the new youth director. I was called last June of 2020, right in the middle of, you know, COVID and everything. We had camp for a week, and then we had to shut down. So, um, yeah, that was my intro to this section of ministry as a director, as a youth director, and a camp director. Um, but God is good, and, and he always blesses us, even when there's chaos all around us. Amen? So I, as, when Pastor Marcelo called me, um, and he invited me to come speak to your church, I, I didn't really know what to preach about because it it happens that it, if i'm not wrong this is valentine's weekend correct and the world is you know this is the one month where everybody's talking about love and they're giving each other chocolates and and just you know it's all about candy and this superficial love right and i kept thinking i want to dig deep into this concept of love and so i started looking through scripture and i started reading and reading saying well what's what's a good love story in scripture and there's so many right there's so many and it, it always goes directed back to God, and the one that has always spoken to me, and it's one that I've preached on before, just not with an emphasis on love, has been Ruth and Naomi, right? We can talk about Ruth and Boaz, but we can't leave out the relationship that Ruth had with her mother-in-law, Naomi. Um, so that's where I want to start this morning, um, and I will segue into something else. And if you can open your scripture, your Bibles, or your cell phones to Ruth chapter 1. And that's where we're starting. And it begins with a woman named Naomi and her husband and her boys. Uh, Naomi was married to Elimelech, and they had two boys named Malon and Kilion. I've never met people with those names today. If you have, wow. Um, and so they moved because there was a famine in the land, and they go to, we're told, they, they, they leave there, and they move to a country called Moab. Now, Moab is not where their people were from, so they would have been alone, and they have two boys who eventually have to get married, and they do get married in this land of Moab. There were just more opportunities there, and they end up marrying two Moabite women of the names of Ruth and Orpah. Now, we're told that some time passes by, and this is, this is probably... If you're, if, if you're ever talking to someone and you want to cheer their day up, do not start with chapter 1 of Ruth. It is the most depressing read, and it's just gut-wrenching and heartbreaking. We're talking about Naomi, who's been married with her husband for years, decades. They have two boys, right? And they, their family is expanding. They have these two young women, Ruth and Orpah. And, and one can only imagine that Naomi is just happy and saying, you know, it, it was the right thing to move to Moab, and, and we're all happy, and we're growing, and we're not dealing with the famine. And the next thing you know, everybody starts dying, right? Elimelech passes away, 
and they're left, the two boys are left fatherless, even though they're married now. But Naomi is left without her husband, her soulmate, her, her, her love. And then, as if that weren't enough, we're told that Malon and Kilion also die. So here is Naomi. Naomi is a mother. How many mothers do we have out there? I'm a recent father, by the way, so I have a six-month-old at home. Beautiful baby girl. And it, let me tell you, it's such a blessing. You also don't sleep at all. But I love her to death. And so to think of Naomi losing her husband, I put myself and I'm like, wow, if I lost my wife, oh, man, it just brings tears to my eyes. And then if I lost my children right after that, how horrible would that be? And Naomi, Naomi doesn't mince words. Naomi says, you know, I don't know what I have done to God to make him mad at me. But wow, like I cannot believe that. This is what life is right now. We're told in verse 6 that Naomi heard that in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people, her people, um, and that there was no longer a famine. So she thinks, well, I have nothing left here. My husband is dead. My two sons are dead. I'm going to go back to where I'm from because I have extended family there, and, and maybe someone will, will help me out. Someone will look after me. And she has Orpah, and she has Ruth with her. And she turns and she tells them, because they're willing to go with them, she says, you know what? Go back, each of you, Ruth and Orpah, to your mother's homes, to your family homes. And may the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. And here in verse 8, actually, in the Hebrew, there's a, a Hebrew word for love that's used. And from what I could find, it was the only time that the word love is mentioned. And the word is hesed. It, would, it means loving kindness. And that's what she's referring to here when she says, May the Lord, may Yahweh show you guys loving kindness in the same way you've shown me and my family. And so she tells them to go back to their gods. She, she understands apparently that Orpah and Ruth were young enough to remarry. And they could go and start families. They would be okay. They didn't have to be tied to her because her future was unknown. It was uncertain. She Back then, you have to remember that the status of women was very, very low. She could not own land. She could not take care of herself. She would have to find someone to take care of her. And she didn't want that for Orpah. She didn't want that for Ruth. She loved them. And so she tells them, hey, you know what? Go back home. Find new husbands. Start a new life. I'm going, I'm going home. Um, Orpah and Ruth argue with her saying, no, no, no. Eventually, Orpah gets convinced, and Orpah goes home to her family. But... Here's the interesting thing, and, and this is the part that always chokes me up, because she has this conversation with Ruth, and they go back and forth. It's like Ruth is saying, no, I'm still not going, and Naomi's saying, but you have to, and I can imagine her, right, convincing her. Like, you have to go. You have a future. You can still have children. You can still remarry, and Ruth refuses. Now, you have to go into this context. She's an Israelite. Naomi is an Israelite. Ruth is not. Ruth is a Moabite. She has been introduced to Yahweh, the God of the Israelites, later in life through her husband and through her mother-in-law and her father-in-law. And she clings, we're told she clings on to Naomi and says, I'm not going to leave you. I'm going with you. That means she's leaving all she has ever known in Moab, all the lands, all the roads, all the people she's ever known. She's willing to leave that, go into a foreign land, by herself, with no men, so just her and her older mother-in-law. That's dangerous. And she acknowledges that the Israelites will most likely not be too kind to her because she's a Moabite and she's a widow. So already Ruth knows in the back of her mind what she is saying to Naomi. But her love for Naomi is so deep and so pure and so kind that she refuses to turn away from her. To me, that is just, she owes, she owes Naomi nothing. That's all I kept thinking was, Ruth, you don't owe Naomi anything. You, you can go and start a new life, and she refuses. To me, that is, that is this, this love that represents, for me, the character of Christ. And all I could think of was, Jesus was the same exact way in that, he doesn't have to love us. He doesn't have to be with us. He didn't have to come down here and die for us. He didn't have to do what he did for us. 
he could have left, started over with probably smarter beings, smarter created beings that didn't fall, that didn't sin, and just left us to be. And he refuses. It's almost as if he clings on to us. And it's not because he has something to gain from it. Because Ruth didn't have something to gain from this either. He does it because he loves us. And to me, that is so mind-blowing because we can't understand that level of love. I think of how much I love my baby girl, my daughter, how much I love my wife. And to me, that's, that's the pinnacle. How much I love my parents, that's the pinnacle. And I want you to do the same. Now take that and go an infinite amount beyond that. We can't. We cannot fathom it because you can only fathom something that you have felt. And to think that God's love goes far beyond what we can even feel at its most purest form of love for our children, for our husbands, our wives, our loved ones, is it's scary and it's, it's so unknown, but it's also so beautiful. Because I know that my Creator loves me to the point that I can never love anything or anyone else. And that gives me this sense of security and happiness. And we know that what happens with Ruth and and Naomi, we know that she eventually remarries. And that out of that marriage comes some children. And then out of those children, what lineage comes out? Yeah, before Jesus, David. Right? David came. And out of the lineage of David comes Jesus. And it's just, it, it, it's fun to think, sometimes for me at least, that Ruth and Boaz both had this very loving, humble personality. They, they obviously loved profoundly. They looked after each other because we can see how Boaz looks after Ruth, even though he doesn't have to. And then out of that lineage, out of those two people, God chooses to create the lineage that the Messiah would be born out of. And to me, that's just, that cannot be a coincidence. That to me is just something so beautiful and profound. And as I looked at the story, I, I thought to myself, that's so beautiful that the story of Ruth and Naomi and Boaz, you know, it's, it's centered in love. It shows us love. But is there more? And I kept thinking, and I just smiled because I was like, of course there's more. Like there's one story that is towers above all the other stories when it comes to love. That's the story of Jesus. And all I kept thinking was society has, quite frankly, cheapened love. Society has made love so just scratching the surface. It's no longer profound. It's what can you get out of it. It's no longer what can you give Because the reality is that the love we see in Scripture, the love that God and Christ show us, is one where you get nothing back. He gave us love when we didn't deserve it. So deep and profound that we could never do anything to earn what he's given. And yet the world and and, and Satan knows what he's doing. He's been able to study us for thousands of years. He has cheapened love. And so on Valentine's Day, the one thing you never hear about, you never see the commercial, right, about the love of Jesus Christ. That's, that's not an emphasis on Valentine's Day. It's all about hearts and cards and, and, and marketing and flowers and purchasing. It's never about Jesus. The one thing you don't have to purchase. The one thing that's free. The pinnacle of love. What do we say all the time? God is what? And... When that hit me, I just started smiling. I was like, oh, this is so awesome. And then I turned to, and I invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 26. Because to me, this is where I began to see how profound the love of Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father was for humanity, was for us. Because chapter 26 starts off with the title, at least in my Bible, it says, The Plot Against Jesus. How sad is that? The plot against the one who is here to save mankind, to give them eternal life, to love them, to not harm them. And here is the plot against Jesus, to murder him. And I read verse 2, because we're told here in, in chapter 26 that when Jesus had finished saying some things, he and his disciples, he said, as you know, the Passover is in two days. It's, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. He acknowledged, he knew what was going to happen. 
From that moment when he knew he was going to be crucified, that he was the lamb going to the slaughter at any moment in his life, could he or could he not have said, God, I don't want to do this. Let's do something else. I'm not doing this. Did he or did he not have that authority? He did. And yet he sat at that table with one of the ones that would betray him and still loved them, still shared food with him, sat with him drank with him and still loved him in the very moment he knew that Judas would come back and betray him. We're told that Judas betrays Jesus, that in the Last Supper, Jesus says, this is who will betray me. And it happens. And then we're told something else. We're told that Jesus tells his disciples, the very night you will all fall away on account of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered but after i have risen i will go ahead of you into galilee and then peter peter honestly is one of my favorite disciples just because he's so hard-headed i can relate so much to him he just never listens to anything that jesus is trying to tell him and peter says even if all of that happens jesus i'm not going to do that i'm not going to betray you i won't pretend that i don't know you and so Jesus sees all of this happening. This has got to be so painful. This is as if it wasn't hard enough. He's got to go through the pain of what we as human beings put him through with sin, the crucifixion and the pain. And then there's this Peter telling him, no, I'm not going to do it. And I, I just picture Jesus's heart just hurting because he knows that Peter's going to do it anyway. And then that's that's love because he doesn't. Say, well, Peter, you're no longer one of my disciples because I know that you're lying to me and that you are going to, you know, renounce me. He doesn't do that. He loves on Peter. And, man, I got to tell you, if you know any Peters, that's got to be difficult. That's got to be so hard. And we're told that Jesus says, when they go into Gethsemane, again, more pain for Jesus. What does he ask the disciples to do while he goes and he prays? And this is, this is such a profound prayer because he's going through it. He's in the middle of it. He's asking God to help him. He's saying, God, I know what's coming. Father, I know what's coming. And what is the one thing he asks these poor disciples to do? And they just cannot get it together. Not once, but multiple times. To pray. He says, wait here, please. And then he says, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here. So he tells them, my heart is overwhelmed. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. I don't know how much more blunt he could have put that. And he's telling them this. And these are his closest people, okay? These are the ones that love him the most, that follow him the most. He spends the most amount of time with them. And he says, later on, he shows up, right? He prays with the Father. And he shows up and he sees his disciples. He says, couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? Just one hour. That's all I asked. And they just couldn't do it. And then it happens again. It says, verse 43, when he came back, he again found them sleeping. Now, he's going through one of the most, if not the most difficult moment, right, in his life at this moment. Because he's he's right there. He understands this is... The night, the hour of the betrayal, this will start. It's going to snowball down. I know how this ends. I get crucified. But this is the only way to save these people that I love. And even until that moment, how painful must it have been that they still couldn't, they couldn't get it together, even for a few hours. Give them a few days of of like love and respect. and, And they just couldn't do it because we as humans are so flawed. And yet, for me, with my personality, and I'm sure with most of you, if you're asking someone for help this much, and they keep messing up this much, how much longer are you going to have them around? How much, you may love them from a distance, but are you still going to do whatever you can for them? Let's be real, I'm not going to. I don't know, that's, that's a tough, you know, that, that's a tough sell for me. Because I am asking you to do things over and over and over again, and you just won't, even the smallest things. But Jesus wasn't like that. Jesus is love. And we go, we fast forward through chapter 26. Jesus gets arrested. We know that Jesus, Judas comes and Jesus tells Judas, just do what you came here to do. He already knows how painful it must have been knowing 
because I'm sure that many moments throughout that Last Supper, many moments, even in Gethsemane, he was praying for Judas because he still loved Judas. And then he sees Judas' face, and Judas betrays him, and he says, Judas, just get it over with. I know what you're here to do. And then it begins, and we're told that it's, he gets presented before the Sanhedrin. Um, and and one, one verse that, that really called my attention, it says, what the Sanhedrin comes to a conclusion at the end of this. They say, he is worthy of death, they answered. And then here's the part that just hurts because I cannot comprehend it. It says they spit in his face and struck him with their fists. Others slapped him and said, teasingly, prophesy to us, Messiah, who hit you? If someone pulls you into a room, starts smacking you, spitting on you, punching you, and making fun of you, are you going to love that person? No. No. And yet Jesus did that with tears in his eyes because he was, even for those same people that were spitting and slapping him and punching him, he knew that that's who he was dying for. I'm sure Jesus can do whatever he wants. I'm sure that Jesus could have made a mental note. I remember you, I remember you, I remember you, I remember you, and you're not going to count on the cross. He doesn't do that. We're told that he died for all of the sins including those who punched him and teased him and said, tell us who hit you because you're the Messiah. More and more pain for Jesus. And the further we go into this story, I want you to, to, to realize what I realized. The deeper and the, the more grotesque this gets, the harder this gets to understand and to see and to picture, it just actually magnifies to us as human beings, the level of love that Jesus has for you and me. Because the more things happened and the worse this story gets, the more I began to realize, you really love us. There is no end to his love. There is nothing we could have done to stop him from dying on that cross. And we move to chapter 27, where Judas hangs himself because he knew what he had done in that moment. And then we go to Jesus before Pilate. And we know how that plays out, where even Pilate, Pilate has this feeling. He's like, this, there's no way we can kill this man. This man is innocent. This man is not who they, I don't know what he did to the Sanhedrin. I don't know what he did to the Jewish leaders. But there is no way that I want this man's blood in my hands. And so what does Pilate do? Pilate washes his hands. And he says, well, listen, I'll let you. And he, in, in Pilate's mind, he never believes that they're going to choose a known murderer over Jesus, who he has already heard heals, feeds, loves, and takes care of people. There's no way. I'm sure Pilate was thinking that. And what do they do? They chose Barabbas. And I picture Jesus there after being beaten, bloodied, bruised, with his head down, knowing who Barabbas is, hearing what people were saying in the crowd, because they were yelling. What were they yelling? He understood the hate and heard the hate in their voices, and that they were choosing a known martyr over him who had never, ever hurt a fly, and who was actually there to save them and grant them eternal life. How painful that must have been. And yet, his love overpowered that pain. His love overpowered both the physical and the emotional pain that he was feeling in that moment. And his true character is revealed because he continues to allow for them to treat him this way. And remind, just to remind you, it's not any average person being treated this way, not just a really good person being treated this way. It's the creator of the universe Amen. being treated this way and choosing of his own volition to allow for these created beings that he created to treat him like trash. But his love is too great. Amen. And then we're told, we fast forward, uh, Matthew 27, verse 27 and 28. says that the governor's soldiers took Jesus into an area and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. As if it wasn't enough what he had already been through. They stripped him 
and put a scarlet robe on him. Here they are making fun of him again. And we're told that they twisted together a crown of thorns. And they set it on his head and they put a staff in his right hand and they knelt in front of him and mocked him. I can only imagine how awkward it's going to be when he comes back for those soldiers. And we're told that they mocked him by saying, Hail the king of the Jews. And then they spit on him. And they took the staff from his hand. And they struck him on the head again and again, repeatedly. Was Jesus dying for those soldiers? I can't begin to imagine how profound the love of God the Father to watch His Son going through that and of Jesus must be to get put through that amount of humiliation, that amount of pain, spitting on you and hitting you and mocking you. They didn't even have the decency of just saying, well, yeah, crucify Him and that's it. They put Him through all of these things. And to me, that just speaks volumes because... All it does, while Satan was trying to take Jesus' face and smear it on the ground, what Satan didn't realize in that moment was that he was lifting up the character of God that is love. All he was doing was showing humanity that their creator loved them more than anything else in the universe. So it backfired. And we know that Jesus eventually gets crucified. And even during the crucifixion, verse 35, it says that when they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. As he's dying, as he's hanging on the cross with nails driven through his flesh, they still mock him and they still treat him like garbage. It says that they kept watch over him, and above his head they placed a written charge against him, saying, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. We're told that while the two rebels were crucified with him, alongside him, those that passed this crucifixion scene hurled insults at him. They continued to mock him. They shook their heads, and they said, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days. Save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law and the elders mocked him. These are the people that knew the Torah. They knew the book of the law, the book of Moses. They knew it in their hearts. They just didn't live it. So they didn't understand what they were doing. And we're told that they mocked him. And they said, He saved others, but can't save himself. Did he die for those leaders? For those casting lots for his clothes who mocked him as they walked by? To me, there is no greater example of love in Scripture or in this world anywhere than these moments here that we find in the Gospel where the Creator, where Jesus, the Son of God, comes down in the most humble of ways, in a manger full of animals and and smelling, and then lives a whole humble life. And then this, this is what humanity gives their Creator. And at any moment, he he didn't have to do this. To me, that is the ultimate example of, of love. You know, this world continues to tell us what love is. And what love is becoming and what love can be, it's right here. We don't need to seek anything more. And for me, as I read that, it it brought tears to my eyes and I just, I felt the shame because I share in this humanity, right? I share in in, in the sin and in in the humanness of all these people that did this to Jesus. And every time that I sin, I added to that weight. And all I could think was, there's no amount of repentance I can have that makes it right. There's nothing I can do or say 
that, that will earn me the salvation that he paid on that cross. Amen. He made it so simple for us as human beings that all he asks is what? What does John 3.16 say? For God so loved the world that whosoever does what? Guys, that is, that is, that is love. Amen. That is love at its maximum. Amen. All he required of us is to believe in him, to accept him as our savior. He couldn't have made it any more simple. I don't have to go to a store and buy something. There's nothing I can ever do through my actions that will purchase my eternal salvation, my forgiveness of sin. Amen. He did it. And he went through all of these horrible things undeservingly because he didn't have to do that. He did nothing to deserve that. And he did it for you and for me. And all I could think was, this world has told me so many times, I'm still fairly young, so I've grown up in this different generation that it's, it's all about me. It's all about how I feel. And there's, there's nothing wrong with that until the point to where you allow it to change your character and now you begin to mistreat others because you are what's most important. I'm so important that I go and I belittle others. I'm so important that it's just me. Everything revolves around me. And I look at this and the character of Jesus, what he did and what he was put through. And many times I've thought, man, like, how can I still be cool with this person? How can I still love that person? after everything that they've done for me. We've all been wronged at different moments in our lives. And the more I think about that, I just, I, I, I had this moment where I, I, I just, I broke down thinking, I am called to reflect the character of Jesus Christ. Yes? To be a Christian back then, in this context, was a mocking. They were making fun of followers of Christ. Because to be a Christian meant literally to be Christ-like. And people who didn't know Jesus or who didn't believe in Jesus viewed to be Christ-like as foolish. Because it was a guy who was crucified and they knew that he was spat upon all of this treatment that he got just to end up on a cross. While the world told you to get revenge. While the world told you to get even. And the character of Christ reflects the complete opposite of that. And so the more I think about that, the challenge that I want to leave everyone here today, as well as myself, is are we called to be reflective of what the world defines as love or of what Jesus showed us and defined love as? Who are we going to reflect? The world and its quote-unquote love? Or Jesus and his love. Because the world tells us one of them will give you success and one of them will make you happy and it's all about you. While the other says, you're a servant leader. You do for others, never expecting anything whatsoever in return. And that's so difficult. That goes completely against our current human nature. To do things with never expecting something in return. And that's the challenge I want to leave to you. We all go through things. Maybe you're going through something right now. And what I want to ask is that you take a moment today, whenever that may be, in privacy, and that you ask Jesus to continue to develop your character. Ask him to make you love others the way he loves you. Amen. And take it a step further. Ask him to make you love others in the way that he loved the Sanhedrin and the chiefs and the leaders, and the Roman soldiers, and the people that smacked him, and punched him, and spit on him. Because when you get to that level, there is nothing, nothing this world can do that will ever waver your faith. Because your faith is on the cross, your faith is on Jesus, and completely centered on his love. You know, during summer camp, this past summer, I had a lot of time, especially because we canceled summer camp after one week. But we did have a lot of staff weeks. It was like four or five weeks with them. And they're all young adults, um, 16 all the way through 24. 
And the one thing that I emphasized the most was the love of Jesus Christ and the relationship that we individually have with him. I think a lot of times growing up, I always thought, well, I go to church, I read the Sabbath school lesson, and I do all of, I do all of these things, and I'm good, right? It wasn't until my early years in college that I realized that in order to truly understand what a relationship with Jesus Christ was, I had to start setting aside devotional time, just personal time between me and God. And that came in different forms because not everything worked for me, not everything will work for you. And it's the same thing I tell my staff. Um, I tried journaling. Uh, I've tried music. i going on hikes. And the reality is any conversation I have with him is prayer. And I found myself a lot of times just sitting in the car or in my room and, and talking to Jesus and, 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 and venting to Jesus, telling him, this is how I feel. I'm frustrated right now. I don't know what's going to happen. At the time, I was a lot younger. God, is this the right woman for me? I don't know if I'm going to marry her. You know, I'm having dating problems or I'm having this problem with family or this problem with my friends. And that, that's, that was my relationship with Jesus. I didn't have to be on my knees. I didn't have to do a very specific thing. I just talked to him, just me and him. And out of that, a a relationship began to develop where now, every now and again, I can just kind of shoot up a smile and just, and and he knows what I'm thinking. And and you, you build this relationship because isn't that what a relationship is? The example I always like to give is uh, for parents and for, you know, kids. Let's say that you only saw your parents once a week, right? And then if you ever wanted to talk to them, you talk to them with very specific words, dear mother and father, and and that's what you did. Only once a week, and maybe like every time you ate, you let them know, right, that you were eating. Is that a relationship? Would that even be a healthy relationship if it was one? So then why do we do it with our Savior? And that's the one thing that I try to emphasize is relationship with Jesus Christ. There's nothing more important to me because at the end of the day, that's what saves us, our relationship with Jesus Christ. Because when we get to heaven, that's really the only thing that matters. That is the only thing that matters. The only thing that's going to be asked is, who do you know? Jesus Christ. And Jesus will look at you and say, yeah, here you are, and hug you and kiss you and hold you, and that's it. That's all that's required. And out of that love for Jesus Christ, our character begins to change and we become different people. We begin to treat people with love and kindness. We begin to use different words. It will change us from the inside out. And then our actions. See, a lot of times, as a child, I was confused. I thought it was the actions first and then through the actions that would happen. But no, it was actually through the relationship with Jesus Christ. Then the actions came because he was changing me through the Holy Spirit. And that's something that I want to leave you guys with. As we dwell on love and as, you know, tomorrow is Valentine's Day, as you sit at home, I don't know if you have plans, and you enjoy that. I want you to remember that there's no greater example of love ever told except for the one that we find in the gospel. There are great love stories, but none greater than this one. And the awesome part for me is that this one's not over yet because we're still waiting for the day when Jesus comes back and we get to be reunited with our loved ones and with our Savior and we get to talk to him. And I picture us just yapping away, talking, talking, sharing with him. And he's just going to smile, being patient with us, because he already knows it. He was there. He's, he's seen it. And to me, that's just beautiful. And it's a day that I long for, and I know we all long for. The one thing that COVID has really pointed out to us is life is short, and it's also hectic and chaotic. And you never know what's true, what's false. But the one thing that we do know is true is that Jesus is coming back. And the only thing that really matters is that we're prepared today. I don't need to worry about what happens tomorrow. I don't need to be worried about, you know, what happens in the future because I don't even know if I'll be there. Today could be my day, and I need to be ready today. And so while we live in a world of a lot of unknowns, we find our security 
in knowing that Jesus loves us, that Jesus died for us, and that Jesus is coming back for us. Amen. Amen. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you so much. In the sacrifice that you made for us on that cross, there were so many lessons. And in a time of the month when we're focused on love, thank you for being the greatest example of love, the purest form of love. It's this selfless love that expects nothing in return. I want to ask in a very special way for the Laurel Seventh-day Adventist Church, Lord, for its members. Uh, no church has escaped you know, what COVID has done to us as a community, as church family. I want to pray blessings upon them, those who were able to come here today and those who weren't able to come here today, Lord. Please continue to be with this church. Allow it to grow, to be a beacon in this community for you and to bring people to you. We know that the time is rapidly approaching when you're returning, and I honestly cannot wait um, because this world is exhausting and this world is a lot. And we can't wait to be reunited with you when we're told there's no more tear, no more pain. There's just no more sin. I want to pray also for the youth of this church, the little kids that we saw here at the beginning. And it brings me joy, Lord, because they're being led and they're being equipped to be the future leaders of this church. Please allow us to continue to give them the positions that you would want us to give them as the future leadership of this church. Please bless them and bless our conference. Be with every member here. You know their hearts, the troubles that they're going through. Please be with them and watch over them. And never let them forget how deeply you love us. Amen. We ask you this humbly in your son's name. Amen. Thy faithfulness, O God, 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 there is no of turning with Thee, Thy compassion they fail not, Thou forever Great is thy faithfulness,
Dear Heavenly Father, great is your faithfulness. Amen. Though things are chaotic in this world, we know that you have not left us. Amen. We know that you will continue to be with us, that you will continue to watch over us. You will continue to bless us. Please be with the Laurel Seventh-day Adventist Church, Lord. Continue to grow them and be with them and love on them. I ask you this in your son's name. Amen. Thank you.